enter here at Cisco. Didi, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so I've got a few questions to you okay. about, well, our latest innovation in Data Center, of course, and um, we've just heard, you know, we David Gettler's keynote, and he did mention ACI Anywhere. Could you explain more about that? Absolutely, so, look, every data center or cloud on this planet was built for one reason, which is to run applications. And the hard choice our customers have to make today is keeping the applications on their data center or moving them to the cloud. Well, that's the innovation we've come out with, that customers do not need to make that choice. There's a single bridge that connects their existing data centers to any cloud, and not just one. It's Amazon, it's Azure, it's any cloud, and that's the big innovation, a Love single that. network that connects Love that. all of these locations. Sounds great, because this is exactly what my customers want, right? They don't want to think of you know, where my workloads are, it's just like anywhere. That's right. And, um, and in terms of like, you know, kind of segmentation, so ACI's brought our customers pretty far, right? So they can basically extend all these policies now to the cloud without anything else. Absolutely, look, what's happening is data is getting distributed more than ever before. Data is the oxygen that feeds the applications and applications are getting distributed. But again, you still need to maintain that single policy, that consistent, you know, security strategy and exactly. whether, whether your workload is on yeah. data center or in the cloud, and that's what ACI helps customers do. Nice, nice, this, this, this sounds amazing. I think it's a really big deal for our customers, It right? absolutely is. Yeah, so um, could you comment more on what, what you were saying, like kind of decentralizing that data, that's an interesting thing, right? Because I think that this is what we see now, right? Because we just heard Liz also talk about the IoT that's strategies, right. so you know, as we go into more and more of Internet of Things, would, you know, data center stay as we know it, or what's, what's going to be in the future? What's your That's vision right. on it? That's right, so, you know, in the past, all the data was in one location. It was a centralized location. That's why we gave it a name, data center. Exactly. Right? <laughs> so, but that, that world has changed, because today there's data on your watch, on your laptop, on your toaster, in your refrigerator. <laughs> it's, it's there in the, in the sensor in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, so data is everywhere. And where data goes, applications go. And where data and applications go, infrastructure needs to follow. And so there's the whole concept of data centers changing. In fact, there's nothing centered about data center anymore, <laughs> right? And that's why we announced this whole vision and innovation around data center everywhere. We brought it to life with technologies like ACI Anywhere and Hyperflex Anywhere. So, that's so it's like data anywhere. That's data anywhere, what we can call data it. center anywhere. <laughs> nice. So what are the you know, biggest challenges you see our customers face in data center. So, like I said, you know, one of the biggest challenges they had was whether to keep the applications in their data center or move it to the cloud. And you know, there was a hard choice, right? Because they've been used to keeping everything on-prem, you know, yeah. get buying all the equipment, training all the staff. But when you go to a cloud, you lose all that visibility, you lose all that control. So what technologies like ACI Anywhere, like Hyperflex Anywhere are doing is they're bringing the simplicity and the agility of public cloud, yeah. but with the control and security you know, that the customers are familiar with and are used to on their on-premise data centers. So it's kind of best of both Sounds worlds. Sounds great. And is there like some kind of a step-by-step -step guidance that Cisco can provide to our customers in their data center strategy? Absolutely, look, you know, I hate telling customers what their journey needs to be, but there's three yeah. big pillars of you know, adoption of this technology. The first one is automation, right? You have to simplify, you have to automate, okay? That's the step number one. Step number two is around multi-cloud, which is the flexibility of going not just to a single cloud, but any cloud. And you know, good multi-cloud starts at home. It's with your own data center, it's with your own private cloud. I love that, I love that comment. Right, it starts right. at so, home, indeed. Yes, that's right, <laughs> yeah. so good multi-cloud starts at home, but then you should be able to connect to any cloud you know, not just Amazon, not just Azure, but any cloud, so that the customers have the flexibility and choice. And step three, something that keeps us all up at night, security. And security Definitely. is not just, you know, in one location, in one data center, in one branch, it's everywhere, all the way to the edge, into the data center, yeah. and into multiple and clouds. And it's the same level of security that you would want to provide, Absolutely. right, you don't anywhere wanna, the data resides. You cannot compromise on security. So, yeah. those Sounds are the three great. steps. Sounds great. Well, thank you, Dudi, so much. It's, sure I'm really pleased to have you here. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thanks for having me. And now we've got Rob uh, back out there. So, Rob, over to you.
Yeah, hey, thank you so much, guys. So, yeah, we're talking data center technologies, and if you guys get a chance in the world of solutions, if you come in and just take a hard right, you're going to see this, this virtual area where Hyperflex is giving you some new experiences, which actually is a good thing to remember when it comes to how Hyperflex is making a lot of experiences a lot easier. Todd, you know, I've been friends for so long. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. I've so enjoyed learning from you and your team. I depend on you quite a bit for this kind of stuff because we're working on new Hyperflex stories for what I do for Cisco. I wonder if you could fill me in, give me the cheat sheet of what do we expect right now with Hyperflex? Where have we been, how are we changing, and what can we learn here in the booth? You bet, so now it's about Hyperflex anywhere. You heard in the keynote this morning, right, we're taking the data center where the data is. And only Cisco can do this, right? You saw everything about ACI anywhere. So it's about taking the fabric, the policy out to these remote sites. And it's all about new sources of computing demand, right? So think about a retail environment, think about manufacturing, there's all these things going on where you've got data being generated, consumed, analyzed outside the traditional data center. So it's kind of scary for me, I've had data center my title in some way, shape, or form for 20 years, but the data center is no longer centered, right? So we got to take computing and storage equation, put it out in the right scale at these remote locations, and that's Hyperflex anywhere, so yeah. 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 So I wonder if you could explain a little bit, just in case anybody's confused about what's happening in the background, because I'm a little bit worried that we're standing in a dangerous area, because these guys, I don't think, are looking at reality as it involves you and I. Yeah. They're looking at some other version of reality, perhaps. Can you explain what you guys are using virtual reality here to explain concepts, perhaps? Well, so here's an example where we've got, uh, you know, Hyperflex out in the wild, right? Yeah, so there's a four node cluster of Hyperflex. These guys are using it. We've actually got some NVIDIA GPUs in the back here, and it's powering this VR experience, and you can just see the latency. It's just reduced dramatically, really smooth, right? So it's all about putting computing where you need that experience. You can't have this running back in some core data center somewhere and try and push that data back and forth. You've got to have it here on the floor. So here's Hyperflex out in the wild, kind of bringing that to life. Well, that's so nice. Here, we'll stand back up, because I know if your knees are anything like mine, it's not going to last very long. Okay, so really it's about reducing the latency and such here. So you mentioned the NVIDIA GPUs right. that we've got inside these right. here. That's an amazing amount of compute power Then we're really pushing on the graphics side with Hyperflex, making that easier? Yeah, I mean, this is literally, uh, you know, our strategy is to put, a, put your data center wherever you need it, right? So this kind of horsepower used to be restricted really to those big glass house data centers. But with our data center strategy, we're basically saying, look, let's put your data center a thousand places at once, but manage it all like it's under one roof. That's, that's, that's what we're doing here. ACI anywhere, Hyperflex anywhere. So when we talk about specific customers and how Hyperflex is changing how they're able to interoperate, I know I've had the pleasure of meeting with customers that you guys have introduced me to, um, and I remember one in particular just talking about how it was one of the few technologies, we often don't get the chance to implement a technology where end users actually notice a big change and they were coming and they were hugging their IT person, you know, expressing physical gratification for the, for the ease of use that they were experiencing because it was giving them back productivity during their day. I assume, are you guys still kind of collecting stories and putting those up on the wall? I've got a great one. So we've got a company called Exmar, a customer rather. Uh, David here is in uh, the show with us. And they're using Cisco Intersight to put these hyperconverged clusters all around the world. They deal in the energy sector. They've got, they support 1,500 ships at sea, you know, moving energy products all over the world. And they run payroll and it's very complex because they've got sailors under all these different flags, right? Right? And the payroll you know, used to run at the end of the month. IT guy deploys Hyperflex, gets a call from the guy who runs finance, says, hey, what happened over the weekend? Yeah. You know, our payroll just ran whatever, two, three times faster than it usually did. What did you do? So those are kind of, and everybody likes getting paid quicker, obviously. So yeah, there's lots of examples like that where you modernize the data center, you go faster, easier to operate. And with Hyperflex anywhere, we're letting them push that out wherever they want to manage it from. Gotcha, okay, and I want to bring in just, uh, we've got about two more minutes left, okay. and I hope, I didn't, I didn't tell you this in advance, and so I hope you're comfortable with it, but in general, for anyone in our audience that's not familiar, for whatever reason, they've not quite made that, that change in their head to understand what hyperconvergence is really doing, because our twist on hyperconvergence is a bit unique. We're doing some things different than others. I wonder if you could give me an explanation of what hyperconvergence is and why Hyperflex has been such a boon for customers and their productivity. I'm really going to ask me that. So we're doing two basic things that are very different, right? If you look at the early hyperconverged solutions, a lot of them were software only, and customers were left with the challenge, okay, how do I create a network that can support this kind of cluster traffic? And then how do I, you know, what kind of server do I want to put it on? So what we did is we came in and said, look, let's put the whole solution together, and we already had UCS, right? So this is a fabric 
you know, enabled an optimized computing system. We put a great file system on top of it to create a hyper-converged solution. And it's really the holy trinity of compute, network, and storage, all in one tight little package, right? So the first thing is we brought everything to the party that Cisco can bring, particularly the networking. Second thing we did about a year and a half ago, you may recall we did Cisco Intersight. And that's our cloud-based systems management platform. You heard Roland talk about it, KD talk about it in the keynote, and the demo they showed there is basically take your computer, it's almost like Meraki, right? So for this audience, computing, we're not exactly famous for computing here at Cisco, but we are famous for networking, and Meraki is a great example of this kind of cloud-managed infrastructure where you connect devices to the cloud anywhere, and then the administrator can connect to that cloud, administrate it from the couch, from the beach, from the data center, wherever. So that's the second big thing. We're the only ones that have this type of cloud-powered systems management, and it just makes it easy to take your data center anywhere. That's it. Now that is awesome, Todd. Now thank you so much. You know what, what Hyperflex has done for me is I, as a, as, a, as a wannabe technologist, a lot of people think I'm an engineer, I'm not an engineer, I'm learning as fast as I can from guys like you and from members of your team. But one of the things I love about it is you made storage approachable for me and those technologies just became so much easier because we removed all the complex language and the pre-decisions and design work and such like this and that allowed not just myself for understanding it, but then the people that I get to talk to are telling me, hey, this allows us to focus on things that are more important. Exactly. You know, and that's a, but guys, thank you so much. Hey, this, Todd, it's always a pleasure thank working you. with you. Thank you. Yeah. Guys, come check out this booth. I think you get to try on these things they yourself. They get, you get to try this stuff on and play with some virtual reality, which is much better than, than, than reality reality. But with that, let's go back to the studio. <laughs> Reality, reality. I think you just coined a new term for us here on the uh, show floor. <laughs> Thank you, Rob Boyd. Great interview uh, with Todd Brandon, our Senior Director of Product Marketing for Unified Computing. What Rob just showed you here in the broadcast is exactly why it is so imperative that you get here to the event. If you want to talk data center and the latest in Hyperflex Anywhere, in Intersight, in Hyperconvergence, in HCI capabilities, extending, simplifying these capabilities all the way to the core and out to the edge, you got to do it here at the show, so we welcome you to be a part of it. And right now, we are headed very quickly into the first of our 11 innovation showcases here at Cisco Live 2019 Barcelona with Roll Roland Acra, our senior VP and GM of our data center business group. We heard from Roland in this great opening keynote, Egerim, um, talking about data center capabilities as well. Um, applications running out to the business, a better experience for the customer, more seamless multi-cloud mobility capabilities, Absolutely. pervasive security. Um, what did you hear about data center and what are we going to hear about here in the Innovation Showcase? Wow, what excited me the most, I think, from Roland's Acura speech right now at the opening keynote was really ACI Anywhere, because like to my customers, that's, I mean, that just hits exactly what they wanted, you know? They love ACI, they, you know, they find it amazing, all the segmentation, security, everything embedded, you know, zero trust security and so on. But then it's like, uh, can I have that, but then in a public cloud environment, right? And now we can actually do that, right? So I think it's really big news for us. It is. One of the best things that I heard in that keynote, um, one of the things that Dave Geckler said was that entire industries are changing as we bring IP to places that have never had it before. IoT is a big part of that. We did start with ACI. We moved to network assurance engine, to wireless analytics, and all of a sudden, guess what we're looking to now? The data center. The data center is what's going to bring us WAN security, not just from a SaaS perspective, but uh, full integration throughout the whole infrastructure structure and thinking about how it affects the entire live network. We're going to head into that innovation showcase right now. Very excited, we'll see you on the back side, enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Innovation Showcase Theater. My name's Toby and I have the pleasure of being your host today. Now we all know that to thrive in the new world of digital business, companies have to innovate at an unprecedented rate. So we're bringing you 11 sessions here at the Innovation Showcase where you will learn the latest solutions, service innovations, and best practices which we know will inspire and engage you here at Cisco Live 2019. Well, if you haven't noticed, Cisco Live Barcelona has sort of been taken over by the data center business unit. And fresh off the keynote stage, I'm happy to welcome Roland Acra. SVP and GM of the Data Center Business Group. But before he comes on stage, we hope you enjoy this video. Here's a question. In a world where data goes everywhere, where does that put your data center?
at the moment trends are born, greeting customers with every detail they need, at the point where all your clouds meet and share, but also on watch, securing everything and everyone. In an uncentered world, you need a data center that extends to every branch, every device, every cloud, everywhere. The Cisco Data Center goes everywhere your data is. Between data everywhere and exactly where you need it, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. How do you like my uh, new best friend? She's, she's our uh, data anywhere best friend. Thank you all for being here. I want to ask just a very quick question uh, to get going. Uh, how many of you have actually followed the keynote, in case I refer back to it? A good, a good majority. OK, great. So <coughs> we're going to have an opportunity to expand a little bit on what I did in short five-minute increments in the keynote. But more importantly, we're going to have the pleasure of also having customers join me on stage and share their own experience and how the technology actually helped them in their own context. The agenda we're going to follow is roughly this one. Recap the data center without boundaries and what we mean by that and, and why this is important. I'll talk a little bit about the intent-based data center and really give it substance and meaning and you know, have you convinced that this is not just marketing speak when we talk about intent-based. We'll go into a couple of customer interviews. Then I'll talk about what's new with the computing environment and the hyperconverged environment of the data center. And then we'll have one more customer to actually make that very vivid for us on stage. Then we'll wrap up. I'll give you a shout out for a couple of additional innovation showcase sessions which are within the data center theme. And then from there, I think you get to enjoy lunch. Um, starting off with a basic premise, right? We would have no data center. We would have no cloud if it wasn't for applications and for the data, right? We don't do data centers for Wi-Fi access points or for things like that. It's all about the application and the data. And so it is really increasingly important that what we used to think of as the data center is following the application and the data wherever they go. Why? Most of you, regardless of your industry, have transformed from consuming software, consuming applications, productivity applications, workgroup applications, databases, and so on, to becoming software development entities yourself, to compete in your own business. If you're in financial services, if you're in retail, if you're in manufacturing, your own software that your developers write is now the way that you compete in your digital environment. And so it's very important for us to put that capability at the center of everything we do and want to make it possible everywhere it wants to go. Okay? The second piece is um, what I talked about during the keynote, which is this idea that the walls of the data center are almost irrelevant, okay? largely because data is growing wherever it's convenient and useful for the business for the data to grow, okay? And also because our developers want to take advantage of whatever makes them the most productive, agile, fast, and get to the business outcome as soon as they want. Again, because now you're in the mode of producing software, not only of consuming software. So the whole business now is really gated by how well your software does because it's your interface to your customers and your partners. So that is why, as you guys saw during the keynote, We've come up with that framework in which we say we need to take the data center wherever the data goes and wherever the application goes. And you see the variety of use cases that drive that, anything from developer wanting to take advantage of rapid tooling or the data never wanting to be in the data center in the first place because it's only relevant in a store and it has a shelf life of when a consumer happens to be in the store. That's when you want to have the action and you know, capture the consumer for some business outcome. Those are all very concrete use cases for which this multiple driver of the data center expanding beyond its traditional four walls. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Um, 
I clicked too fast. We captured that during the keynote with those two main legs of the announcement today. One is ACI Anywhere, and the new frontier for ACI you saw was actually the public cloud. Two leading public clouds today, more to come in the future, both Amazon and Azure. For Hyperflex, different destination, scaling out to hundreds of remote endpoints in the enterprise, but still outside of the traditional data center, right? Because that's where the data is, that's where virtualized or software-defined storage wants to be, because that's where the applications that act on that data needs to act in the moment and on location, wherever that data is, and wherever its business benefit is going to be. And I want to really hammer home that point of our commitment to what we call multi-cloud for everything that we do, right? And in a public cloud setting, it's obvious what that means. It's multi-cloud, that means show me that I'm not locked into any one cloud vendor and I can take it conveniently wherever the tools are better or the price is better or there's a local data uh, in-country governance that says that cloud guy, if he's in my country, I'm going to use their capability. But there is an equivalent meaning to multi-cloud on-premise, right? It is the openness of everything we do, whether we talk about network fabrics, whether we talk about storage and hyperconvergence, to saying yes if it's a VMware environment, but saying yes if it's an OpenStack environment, saying yes if it's a Hyper-V environment. Same thing for OpenShift, same thing for Kubernetes, same thing for any framework, because the reality is at any point in time, you will have applications on several of these. The bare metal applications don't seem to be going away anytime soon. Mainframes are here, Oracle slash Sun servers are here, and there's a number of applications that are perfectly happy being on there, don't need to be rewritten, and aren't going to go anywhere. Anything that was done over the last decade or so probably was done in a virtualized environment as a VM on one or more hypervisors. Anything that's being done in the last 10 days or so is probably getting done in a microservices approach on one of the favorite uh, container environments. And again, being integrated and making it possible to do all of them at once within one or more environments is super critical. And of course, we would think exactly the same thing of the APIs of the public clouds where we want people to be able to take advantage of more than one at a time. So that's really a very fundamental piece that gives, I hope, meaning and light to what we mean by, by multi-cloud enablement, private as well as public. Now, um, three elements are going to be a recurring theme in what we talk about. The first one is automation. Again, why is automation important? You are being asked to do more with the resources that you have. And why more? More is because, again, the job of making third-party software available to your users will always be there. The databases have to work. The financial systems have to work. The office or other productivity tools have to work. The more is you have a new warrior class in your company whose job is to make your company competitive in a digital world, and we together cannot stand in their way or slow them down. We need to let them go as fast as they want because that's the competitiveness of your company that's at stake. Without automation, I don't know how we get there, right? We don't have more budget raining on us, and that's really a critical component of letting you do more with the, KP, with the headcount that you have today. Multi-cloud, I, I hope I've, I've driven that, that point home in, in every aspect of it. And then security. Security is a long, long subject. I'm not going to do it justice here. I'm just going to call out one aspect of security, which is very fundamental to today's applications, OK? What is special about today's applications? One thing that's special is many of them drive their value from acting on data, consumer data, operational data, infrastructure data. Whoever has data has responsibility today. You can no longer be casual about data, right? We will be front page news if we don't treat data with respect and with the obligations that regulators and uh, good uh, stewardship of the data would require us to do. Which means that those applications today that are multi-tiered applications, what we think of as an application, you guys know, is no longer you know one piece of code sitting on one CPU behind one port. It's a multi-headed hydra of 
you know, a bunch of web servers, a bunch of database nodes, a bunch of things in the middle, and together that collection is the application. And we need to take the framework that says, can I make sure that the database is only accessible because of the, it may have consumer data, by whoever needs to access it, no more, no less. And make that possible when that database is moving around because there's something called vMotion or something else that decides at 10 o'clock in the morning it's good to put it on this server, but at 2 o'clock in the afternoon I'm going to move it and put it on another server for good reason. That's you know, for cost optimization or for capacity planning. We want to make all of that possible. The mobility of the workload, the mobility of the data within the data center or across into clouds and the enterprise branch. Those are why in a data center context these words have a very strong meaning and a very concrete uh, vivid, I hope, um, context that I want to give. Let's talk about intent-based data center and again, the substance that's behind it, okay? Um, we talked about how without automation, we're not gonna get there. The first step of being able to automate something is to be able to formally declare what it is that we're trying to do. Like if there's no journey that has a destination that says, get me here, I don't know how to do it manually or automatically. So there's something fundamental about intent-based networking, which is forcing the clarity of the contract that an application requires of the infrastructure. It could be a connectivity contract. It could be a security contract. It could be a performance quality of service contract. No more than 10 milliseconds. Never drop my packets. Any of those, when we give users the ability to formalize and declare this is what I need you to do for me. We open the door to many things, but the most important thing we open the door to is assurance, because now you can measure, since we stated the contract, you can say, is there a gap between what the infrastructure has actually done, based on the telemetry and on the state of the infrastructure, versus what we promised we would do. Whereas when it was a fuzzy, mushy, let's just put a bunch of commands and a bunch of servers and a bunch of networks, you were guessing what the outcome was actually, what, what it was, right? I don't know what this guy was thinking at two o'clock in the morning when he or she just changed the configuration on one system. Whereas here you have one source of truth and one place to measure up to. It's a very subtle but important point about why declaring the intent and making it explicit is actually a good thing. Now, um, in our view, we have that virtuous trilogy between formulating the intent executing the intent, and then assuring against the intent. And I'm gonna put just a very quick product personality against that trilogy, and talk very briefly about three products here that participate in that intent-based data center in, um, uh, in, the, in the infrastructure. The first one I'm gonna talk about is ACI, right? ACI, we've heard it this morning, is about automation is about bringing policy as part of the connectivity, meaning selective connectivity, that follows the workload, which is the object of the connectivity, anywhere it goes. It should not be linked to location, it should not be linked to where it lives, it should be linked to who it is and what it is. Okay, and then the job of the fabric is to make it true. And we're excited to have taken this ACI capability everywhere, including now into the cloud, the crowning of a lot of decoupling of ACI from being in one place to multiple places to not being dependent on the hardware to becoming completely now a virtual entity over a public cloud. Now, we often hear that in a world where there's a lot of sensitive data, and we want to be very selective about saying who gets to access the data, we come into something called a whitelist policy model which is very counterintuitive to anybody who's done networking growing up with IP. IP was all about anybody talks to anybody except a few exceptions, which we used to call access lists. Well, in a world where you want to do something which is very regulatorily compliant, you want to say only what I explicitly authorize should go, everything else is in no. That's real security because you may not know where you're gonna be living. You could be in a cloud, you could be in a noisy place, or in a dangerous place. That's called the whitelisting model, which says explicitly, we should be saying, this is a database with consumer data, who can access it, on which port, in which direction, and so forth. And same thing for every other piece. Well, this is a very difficult problem, 
if each application, one application, may have 10 or 15 or 50 components, databases, web servers, load balancers, other things, and I've got a couple of hundred applications, which is not that crazy, even for a medium-sized environment, you can see the combinatorial explosion of how many thousands of whitelist things you need to do. And we decided to leverage the power of data, which our network is capable of generating on the fly, to inform what the graph of connectivity is. So let's learn it. Instead of you having to run around and interview developers, we learn. Peter calls Paul on port XYZ. Mary calls Jane on this and that. We build the picture of what's normal, and that hopefully helps you get 95% of the way to what your policy needs to be. And then if we got a 2% wrong, you're already you know, way, way ahead. That's really the power of learning behaviorally what an application does, how it behaves when everything seems normal, and then building the very tight policies to only allow what looks normal, and then everything else be denied by default. That's really a much stronger security posture than let's let everybody talk to everybody and then hope we catch all the exceptions. And then I talked about assurance. The benefit, again, of assurance is compliance and proof point. You don't believe where you declared the intent to tell you whether assurance is actually happening. You go to the network itself, you scoop up state, and you say, the contract said X, Y, Z. I gathered all the state. Does the addition of all the state deliver on what the contract said? Or is there a gap? And to give you those capabilities are a tremendous amount of help, particularly in regulated environments where you have to show compliance for the whole year that you get audited for. Okay? Very important piece that we're very excited about. Now, um, a lot of what we do these days is software-based, right? Software defined everything. We're super excited about software benefit. Why? Because it gives you flexibility, it gives you choice, and software goes to the cloud when the workload goes to the cloud. However, in order to do good policy, in order to do the visibility and the telemetry, which I mentioned, that informs tools like titration. In order to do QoS contracts and service level agreements on performance, if the hardware is not capable of delivering this at wire speed, we're not delivering on the contract. And so we're very committed also to taking in the hardware picture forward. When we go to new speeds, we go to new speeds with features enabled. We don't do the compromise do you want the features or do you want the performance? That's a devil's bargain. So really very important to do it right when we take things to the next level of performance and speed. And then I want to encourage you to go out and look at some new great insights and uh, either on the performance level or on the availability level that the telemetry that we gather from the systems make possible. There are uh, booths here where you can take a very, very compelling and vivid look at those and I invite you to go take a look at these. Um, uh, insight applications, either with ACI or with NXOS and DCNM, it, they're, they're equally will work for both environments. Very strong new capabilities. Now, with this, what I'm going to do is invite Pierre Hérault, who's the head of platforms at C Discount, to join me on stage. Pierre, welcome on stage. Hi, Roland. Hello. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, C Discount and the business that you're in. Okay, so um, C Discount is a um, leader in e-commerce in France, and as such, uh, we are the second largest e-commerce company in Europe. Um, if I can give you some figures, um, we have 50 million products uh, inside our catalog. Um, we have approximately uh, 1 million visitors, unique visitors per day, a typical, uh, typical day. And during the last Black Friday, we had um, 150 orders per second and 10 million visitors in one day. <clears throat> so you're in the business of competing with Amazon in your local geography. Not, not a game for the amateurs. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's true. Um, you know, every day we have to compete against this big giant, and we have to uh, be very efficient the way we are deploying things. So um, last year and the, the, the year before, uh, we deployed uh, 
a new uh, network inside uh, one of our data center. We replaced three uh, old networks with, with one new network based on Cisco ACI. And last year, we changed, uh, we mi migrate one data center uh, to a new data center with Cisco ACI. And what have been some of the changes you've seen in going from a non-ACI traditional model to an ACI model? What, what, made, what changes has that made <coughs> for you? With ACI, we, we have um, a lot of possibilities, uh, new possibilities. You know, um, with the new, um, the new uh, technologies which are coming inside the data centers like containers, VMs, um, you have to be more efficient when you deploy things and you are, your developers want you to be uh, more efficient to deploy things. So with ACI, we are able to, um, uh, my, to, to um, uh, upgrade all our networks from one point with the controller, and um, we can apply profiles uh, to every port of uh, our network from one place. Hmm. So, so diversity of hypervisors or containers, consistency of upgrades. Um, ACI, we've done a lot of integrations with third-party systems, either security or application delivery. Any of those have been useful in your context? Yeah, true. Um, we have, as I said, we have containers, so um, uh, we are going to interconnect ACI with Kubernetes, but we have already interconnected uh, Cisco ACI with uh, Checkpoint uh, to be able to take the objects inside ACI, inside the, the rules that we have in the firewalls. Uh, we are going very soon uh, to interconnect it with uh, VMware, and um, we continue the, the integrations. For example, we are using uh, Terraform and Ansible to uh, automatize things on our networks. And uh, last week, uh, we created a script to uh, synchronize objects from ACI and uh, other uh, applications inside our uh, software, uh, inside our IT. Great, great. So um, you're doing it like a pro, which I guess in, in the online retail space, it, it's your only choice is, is to be on top of the latest tools. Any, um, any wow moments, any unexpected benefits or things that you'd like to share that struck you? As I said, uh, the biggest wow effect, if it's one, is, is that we, we can upgrade uh, all the network with, from one point and uh, from the controller, and um, it's a very uh, interesting thing. Hmm. Um, and for the security guys, it's very important to have policies applied to, uh, apply to every part of the network to ensure that uh, the servers can access only to the things that they should have. Selective, selective access. And one last question, uh, Pierre. Um, the, um, the cloud enablement now, ACI into the cloud, does that have a use case for you? We, we are going to look at it. Um, we are a, a consumer of uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, Azure? So, uh, we are going, if we can interconnect uh, our on-premise Cisco ACI with uh, Azure um, in the next months. Okay, great. Please join me in thanking Pierre. He took time and openness. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And next, I would like to invite Adrian Conley from British Telecom. So I'm going to ask Adrian to introduce himself, but we're going to hear a different perspective from um, an integrator and partner who helps us take the technology to enterprise customers and make it actually integrated into their business. But, let me ask you to introduce yourself and where in BT you fit, Adrian. Yeah, so good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Adrian Comley. Um, I'm a product manager for BT Global Services, and I look after the software-defined networking portfolio. So one of the things I do is to, to work with Cisco, take their ACI product into BT, put a managed wrap around that that we then sell to our end customers. Hmm. Now, BT is well known as a managed services organization always have been very strong with that. How is ACI helping you achieve your managed services capabilities? So um, for our customers, they, they tend to have um, key use cases that we would deploy ACI. So for example, they, they're looking to move to the cloud, but they can't move completely. 
And that could be because of security issues or regulation um, that stops them moving all of their workloads. Or they've got bespoke applications that need um, to be run in a private data center, that, the, that special environment that won't quite work in a cloud environment just yet. Any results you could share with us that your customers are seeing from yeah, your so, approach? So let me just give you a few examples of where we've deployed this. Um, the first example would be um, the fact that for, from ACI, we can get an API. So we can pull out loads of data, and we can give that to our customers in terms of customized reports. So one of the basic things we can do is provide a uh, report on auditing the environment. So let's look at what the physical inventory, the virtual inventory is out there, and give that to customers in a, in a specific report. Another example would be um, our security center, so our SOC. We'll be able to analyze the entire fabric, and if they find an anomaly, um, like a virus, then they can isolate that VM from the rest of the fabric at the press of a button. Um, and sorry, but one other quick example um, based on uh, um, an actual case is that one of our, uh, we can look at anomalies across the fabric. So we were able to work with one of our customers and um, identify one of their um, end users who was downloading films illegally. Um, and we were able to identify within three physical meters uh, which devices were being used to do those downloads. Ooh. Okay, so great security. Um, how about the data center goes anywhere the data goes? Does that align with a uh, set of scenarios that BT is actually interested in? Absolutely, so I think, think what's particularly exciting for me about the announcements we've heard this morning is that um, you know, our customers want to be able to have a mixture of the uh, pu public and private data centers in their estate. So um, absolutely, this, this aligns perfectly with where we're going and where our customers are going. And so, once your customer gets deployed and are in operation and have optimized things around current capabilities, where do you see the next set of challenges? Where do they go next? What can we do okay. to help you go there? Okay, so I think that the next thing is really looking cross-domain. So if we look at the LAN environment, we look at the WAN environment and the data center environment, it's better to join those up, uh, both in terms of kind of a software-defined uh, products, but also sitting above that, it's the reporting capability, the analytics that then provides the information to be able to manage that. So again, one of the things that was announced today was about AppD being able to provide customers with a holistic view across these uh, environments. So I'm particularly excited by that kind of development. Yes, yes, the connections between app dynamics and the infrastructure. One, any last uh, wow factor that you didn't expect? That you, I guess, you know? um, from a, from a deployment that we did for a global retailer, uh, multi-site deployment, uh, multi-pod, uh, we deployed all of the physical kit, and then um, Charlie Greenaway, who's our, who's our expert in BT, was able to deploy the configurations right across all those sites within a couple of seconds at the press of a button. So for me, that was a, deploying that so quickly it was a real wow moment. Adrian, thank you so much for Thanks sharing so much. your experience with thank us. You. Please join me in thanking Adrian. Thank you. All right, let's move on to what we're doing equally importantly in compute and hyperconvergence. We have a ton of exciting things that I want to make sure I get across, as well as have a customer talk to it with uh, a context that, that's a business uh, clear one. So we've been on that journey of taking advantage of components, of nuggets of technology, and trying to make them simpler to consume, right? We see new forms of memory today in servers. I'm going to talk about it a little bit. We see new GPUs augmenting CPUs. We see all these bits of, of components, and our job is to say, can we actually make you adopt them by taking on the integration and the complexity and simplifying it? And the few ingredients we bring to this are things like infrastructure as code. We turn the resources of a server into programmable entities that you can decide how you allocate them between multiple applications or VMs or containers sharing the pooled infrastructure. We bring cloud de delivered management as a key component of enabling that simplification of absorption um, of the technology. And then hyperconvergence itself is nothing if it's not a simplification and, and a speeding of deployment of applications. We go back a long time since the inception of UCS, 
with having delivered a server as a model. Every piece of the server, whether it's the memory or the fan or the power supply or the network interface card, to let you carve them up and dynamically manage them as a function of the workloads that dynamically get deployed on these. I'm going to illustrate this with something new today that you're going to be increasingly hearing about. The Optane new hybrid memory from Intel. It's a, it's a wonderful technology that gives the best of what RAM, dynamic RAM can do and what flash can do. It brings the persistence of flash with the speed of access of memory and gives you that continuum. Well, that's wonderful. How does a developer take advantage of it? How do you allocate it? This thing can be configured as persistent memory, so it feels like flash and disk, or it could be configured like RAM, so you have very rapid access uh, time to it, but with a lot of depth. We're taking the same constructs that we've done for CPUs and for other things in order to make a technology like this that's very powerful, but very hard to operationalize by a developer, and just making it a very easy thing that flows within how you orchestrate a server. Those are some of the very exciting things that we really get up at night for, because that's bringing a new nugget of technology and making it consumable by people who have a job to do and, and need to get it done within their workflow quickly and well. Um, I want to talk about some IT initiatives within which I'm going to put in some new capabilities we're announcing here. Data center modernization is one that we've been on. Application modernization, container-based microservices and so forth. Data intensive solutions. We see more and more of these for obvious reasons. Um, the multi-cloud, both in its private and public definitions that I've been talking about. And last but not least, the use cases where from big data we're going to not only training complex models but inferences on that data. And the good news is we have a ton of exciting things that I want you to be visiting throughout the show floor. Anything from on the top right, we have a new converged infrastructure with our friends at NetApp that has GPUs embedded. So now you could do a converged infrastructure stack optimized for machine learning workload. Very exciting new first to the world kind of combined capability. At the bottom, we're continuing to integrate with every form of object storage as well as secondary software defined storage. New announcements that you can go see with Cohesity as well as with Cloudgen. One for uh, object storage, one for, well, I said them backward, one for software defined secondary storage and one for object defined storage. Um, new cases and new servers that you can take a look at with um, GPU optimized for machine learning capabilities and increasingly combining with the software stack developers for machine learning to give you a running start in the long tradition of solutions that we've been bringing to you where we pre-configure, pre-integrate, and pre-test workloads like databases, workloads like big data systems, and now new workloads like machine learning libraries and environments. So very, very excited about many of these. I said multi-cloud. OpenShift is the latest thing that we've now integrated with Hyperflex as yet another way applications can get deployed and we provide the software-defined storage for it. So very excited about these things. I want to um, wrap with one, the most exciting of all for me. We talked about InterSight many times. We talked about the benefit of cloud-delivered management. Cloud-delivered management is very nice to configure things. Cloud-delivered management is critical for diagnosing and debugging things. This is the stuff we don't talk about enough. People talk about automation. I guarantee you 90% of the time they mean automating configuration. Very nice. We need it. Orchestration, all of that is super important because you get repeatability, you get consistency. What do you do at 2 o'clock in the morning when there's a problem? That's where you go, I am glad that there's a cloud service that is harvesting the telemetry from the systems on an ongoing basis, not when there's a crisis, on an ongoing basis, so that we can preventively say, we know the feature you're using on the version that you're using has a known bug. Somebody else ran into it. Why would you let you run into it instead of telling you proactively, that's a well-known bug. Here's a better image for the feature that you're using, right? Availability is the name of the game for anybody who's in the business of infrastructure, right? Don't tell me anything else if you're not available first, up and running. And so anything that can help 
prevent outages, which take away availability, or shorten the window of diagnostics and pinpoint root cause. All of those things to me, as somebody who knows what it's like to run networks, not only to configure them and walk away, those are tremendous use cases of where the cloud makes a huge difference in making the next customer get the benefit of what we learned from the previous customer through that common cloud system. So, um, we talked about Hyperflex Edge, uh, anywhere, I've talked about all these capabilities, very excited about those. Go out and look at them during the, the technology demonstrations. But what I would like to do is now have somebody who actually is using those things speak to it in a better way than I ever would. Benno Schindler from Alliance. Benno, welcome Good on stage. Good So, Benno, everybody knows Alliance, but Tell us where in Allianz you fit and what's new and exciting at Allianz and then we'll get into the technology. Absolutely, Roland. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining here. So my name is Benno Schindler. I'm a program director at Allianz. And you could also say I'm the ringtone in your ear if you place a call to Allianz. So everybody knows Allianz. Allianz is around since over 125 years. We're serving about 88 million customers today. And we are on a constant simplification journey. For us, this is a journey with Cisco, and it's a three-stage Cisco journey. So I wanted to give you stage number one. We've started in 2006 when we put in ICM as the contact center solution into the contact centers in Germany. We still left in all the PCN equipment. About six years later, that development was obsolete. We had to really go to voice over IP. So we engaged Cisco Advanced Services in order to create a blueprint for us that we're still rolling out internationally today. So this blueprint was Cisco UCS. Again, six years later, that journey was not at the end, and we had to go to the next stage. It was not enough to have a single data center per country. We needed two data centers in a region in Europe. And this is when we moved to Hyperflex. Hyperflex really gave us the promise and really satisfied the promise that we would have an environment that could really scale for us. So for us, Hyperflex means it's really a hyper-critical workload for Allianz. It's probably the most critical workload within Allianz. So now you're tempting me. What is hypercritical in the context of Allianz? Yeah, hypercritical in the context of Allianz really means we have a 150,000 calls average on a business day. This is about 31, 32 million in a year. This really means we're serving 46 sites and we're serving 15,000 agents. If this stops, it breaks our neck. So as it doesn't break our neck and it's running very stable since we've had to put it into place in 2018, it's serving as the baseline that we are able to give our group companies the standardization they need and really the access to new technologies that they want. Hmm. So for us, the idea is really to have Hyperflex as a quasi-standard in the UCC environment with Cisco. Hmm. And how, how did Hyperflex actually help you address the challenges that you had? Any yeah. capabilities in particular that you'd like to highlight? Yeah, there's really three things that we got from Hyperflex that we were expecting and it really got fulfilled at the end. Yeah? Number one is reduction in run cost. That's the most critical thing. Number two then is reduction of complexity, simplicity. And number three is flexibility. Number one and two really come together. I told you we've been consolidating environments and we've been able to really give our customers a promise that we run backup, virus protection, monitoring, all in a shared stack. But for compute, we could give them a dedicated space. Roland talked about the noisy neighbor yesterday. Our customers were really, really afraid of having impact from their fellow neighbor customer on them, destroying the system. So Hyperflex really give us that flexibility running dedicated per OE. And then, the last thing in this domain really is to make sure Hyperflex would really go in the um, scalability direction. So we had started with Hyperflex and a certain compute footprint, but we realized just a quarter before we wanted to go to production, we'd done some calculation mistakes and the compute wasn't enough. In the past, this would have meant for us millions of investment. We've never made it in the six-year product life cycle of the previous iterations I told you, stage one and stage two, to upgrade. With Hyperflex, Benedict, we were able to put in new compute within four weeks. 
and that really satisfied our needs. So we're really flexible, and we hope we flexible. We will be flexible with Hyperflex in the future. Hmm. So some very concrete, measurable results. That that's very helpful. Um, how about future? Where do you see the future of Hyperflex helping you get to your next levels? Yeah, our future basically is driven by the business. So I told you about simplification. That's really crucial for our customers. There's customer centricity. This is very crucial for our customers. And then it's also important that we do digital first. Yeah? Our interactions with the customer should be digital at the beginning. So what this means, we have to put in a lot of self-service in the contact center. And no one really knows what's really going to take on with customers and what not. So we are running, really, the POCs in a three months period, a new POC every three months. So what we need from Hyperflex for this is to really go in the, um, in the cloud domain and run hybrid workloads. Mm -hmm. So that's really uh, critical for Hyperflex for us. And then the second thing is, and this is a personal um, thing from my side, we need to make sure we get more efficient with using compute. Yeah, today, in a real-time environment, we're using between 12 and 25% of CPUs at any given time. So the carbon footprint with this is not ideal. So we need to move in optimizing the carbon footprint on the Allianz side. The famous bin packing problem of, of sweating, the, sweating the assets much more. Well, I want to broaden it just with the last question. Are there other things on the floor here or in the show that you'd like to learn more about or, or talk about besides Hyperflex? Absolutely, Roland. You know, for us, we are driven from the contact center innovation cycle with Cisco. So we've just released UCCE version 12. You have released that at Cisco. So we are very excited to see how this will come into play, how we can upgrade to that, and really have an interaction with you guys on how did you overcome the challenges for this. So that's really what we are interested in, seeing how you do your digitalization journey. Benno, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Hold on. Please join me in thank you, thanking Benno for his openness and his enthusiasm. Very contagious energy, Venno. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to wrap up with a couple of things. One is an exciting new piece of news. When you are in the business of software, which we increasingly are, and I've lined up here the leading software capabilities that are in a data center context, anything from Tetration, App Dynamics, Cloud Center, Hyperflex. We're wrapping those into what we call an enterprise agreement framework. This is really an ease of consumption and uh, of, of delivery. So if a customer goes in and buys more than one of these, number one, the purchasing steps are streamlined and, and integrated. And then the more of them they consume, the better of a deal they will get in an enterprise-wide setting. So that's really a very exciting new business, ease of doing business, in addition to the technology pieces that we talked about. I hope you guys will find those very useful. And uh, again, you see the breadth of um, uh, products and capabilities that are included in that enterprise agreement. And you know, at Cisco, we've done enterprise agreements of this kind in other contexts, like security and software-defined uh, wide area network and so on. And the benefit of this is not only does this EA give the convenience and the economic benefit within the data center, but it actually can be joined with other enterprise agreements. So somebody who's bought two or three components in the security suite, and one or two here can see the benefit of joint enterprise agreements. So there's a real concern here for you finding it easier to consume software at a very large scale. Um, <coughs> excuse me, last but not least, I want to do a shout out for two more innovation sessions that will be right here, um, relevant to data center topics. One will be the private cloud, multi-cloud session. You will hear more about Hyperflex anywhere. You will hear much more about Cloud Center and all the other things we're doing. And that will be on Wednesday. And then there will be a very data-centric session that will be taking place in two days. You'll hear more about App Dynamics. You'll hear more about Tetration. You'll hear how we scoop up data and act on it for very concrete benefits. When we talk about you know, data and machine learning and so on, we always ground it to an outcome. What are we trying to achieve? Is it security? Is it protection? Is it application performance? And you're going to hear about some exciting integrations which are recent across many of these products. So those are two sessions. For those of you data center jocks, I really encourage you to go do. And of course, meet the engineers at the demo booths, get intimate with things, ask all your questions. That's in the end what, what Cisco Live is for, learning from one another between us and yourselves, but also between you and, and your peers. 
So thank you. Thank you so much for listening to me twice today. Um, I look forward to seeing you around the show during the rest of the two, three days of the show. And uh, bon appétit for lunch. Thank you. All right, guys, we are back in the studio, but we are still talking about data center. In fact, as Roland was talking about the uh, enterprise agreement, we're going to have some more details on that and uh, allow to make sure you fully understand just how valuable that program can be in just a moment. But right now, I want to talk about intent-based networking in the data center. We've got two awesome guests with me. Danny, I'm not going to say your last name because I can pronounce it. And TJ, we agreed, is how I was going to get to say your name because <laughs> as an American, I can't do the, the right guttural sounds. But guys, welcome. Thanks, uh, Rob. Thank nice you. to see you, man. Yeah, I've enjoyed both of your work and the team, work of your teams for quite some time. As Danny, let's start with you. In terms of intent-based networking when it comes to the data center, uh, but in general, really, how do you define it? It's a great question. I think it's, uh, it's one of those more nascent terms right now, right? Everybody's trying to figure that out. I'm trying to figure out if it's real. <laughs> yeah, right? so yeah. I think the best way I explain it to folks is I look at intent-based as almost the evolution of automation. So okay. if you think about as an industry, we've been getting pretty good across the board at being able to automate moves, changes, day-to-day -day right. things. Yeah. But what we never really did was complete the full life cycle of automation. And there's a ton of time that needs to be spent on the troubleshooting and the, right. um, the, the compliance and making sure that the intent of the network is actually being adhered to. Sounds like more of an operations kind of focus. It, it is, and yeah? so the best way to summarize it, there's three things to remember, Rob. Okay. Oh, right. This will be easy All for right. you, man. You All got right. pen? I don't, I have a fake <laughs> one. Here, I'll use my Apple pen. Good. So, the first step is translate. translate. So we try and understand what the business intent actually is, but okay. then translate that down into IT policies that can get pushed out to the, to the infrastructure. Okay. The second piece is we have to activate it. So how do we automatically Push all, that pull, push all that policy out to the infrastructure across the board. The switches, the load balancers, the firewalls, everything in the network that needs some config. Okay. And then the last piece, and I'd say this is kind of the keystone of where Cisco is really, really unique right now, is that assurance side. So how do we assure mm. that the original intent actually stays intact? Yeah, so okay, so translate? Translate. Act, act activate? No, activate. what was Activate. Oh, it was activate, okay, and then uh, assure. <laughs> and assure, yep. Okay. So, because I was trying to think of an acronym, which is the only way we remember anything around here. It could be but bad. It might. Uh, yeah, exactly. I know. I was like, maybe I shouldn't go there. Uh, well, we talk about the building blocks of what makes uh, what makes up intent. It sounds like you're saying what some of those things are. Those are the elements that feed into this. But I think the most important part is that insurance piece, because I think many other companies have, have gotten the first two, perhaps in various in various uh, ways. Yeah. Ways, but it's really circling back around and feeding it back into the system, so there's a closed. Absolutely. Repeating yep. loop, Absolutely. is that the right way to think That's about it? That's why I tell guys, like, you should be expect, whether or not Cisco or not, this is what customers should expect from their vendors into. This is the new bar, it I has like been that. raised. I like that. All right, TJ, you were nodding your head there, and so yep. I'm assuming you agree, did Danny say it the way you would have said it if we didn't have him with us? <laughs> Danny uses the fantastic nice words, but, it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. but I totally agree. It's the assurance part up levels, the conversation okay. that we've been having about networks, about fabrics, yeah. to the whole new level, right? I, I like the analogy that I've been starting to use with the Minority Report movie. Okay. And if you actually know the movie I with do. Tom Cruise. I went and rewatched it because we were getting some new references. It's, yeah. it's, it's <laughs> actually really amazing because you have these precogs that yeah. are laying there in a pool with wires attached to their head and those wires feed into a computer and the computer runs mathematics to yeah. come up with a warning before bad things happen. And that's exactly what we're trying to do when okay. we're trying to bring assurance into an ACI fabric. We want to warn people about things that are going to happen in their fabric that are not intended yeah. to happen before they happen. So we're not waiting for packets to flow through the network. We, we're mathematically creating a model that says, this thing that you've just done, we think you meant to do something else. Or these trust zones, these security zones, where you think no traffic could flow, right. Well, maybe nobody's trying, <laughs> yeah. but if they did, it would actually work, right? And that's what we're adding as a next layer of assurance on top of an ACI fabric. Yeah. Now see, that's interesting because I think the big thing, and if we don't realize this kind of thing, is security historically has always been, to use one example, I know it goes much further than security, has, is such a reactive sport. In other words, yeah. 
the reason why we weren't planning for that eventuality is because we hadn't imagined that it could happen. And I think what you're saying with this precog reference is this notion of seeing the future. It's saying, by the way, the system, you're saying, has the ability to tell me there's a possibility that yes. this pathway could be leveraged. Someone may discover that. Let's discover it as an operations before yep. the bad guys. I'll, yeah. I'll give you even a more definitive right. practical use case. So just think about change control in general. Most engineers, operators that are in a network, they spend a ton of time setting up the change. Sometimes weeks in advance, you're, you're, you're trying to work it in a dev environment. Then you have the change window Saturday night at yeah. two o'clock in the morning and that takes about an hour. Yeah. And then the next day, your, your fingers crossed that everything comes up online because and your customers start showing true. up in the morning. It's yeah. a big event to fear. So we've been able to automate Historical. the change, okay. but we never really did a good job of automating, as an industry, I don't mean right. Cisco, anybody, right. never had a good system for automating the pre-change and the post-change. Hmm. But that's 80% of the time, yeah. is, all the, is yeah. all the validations. So what TJ's referring to is, you're literally saying in advance, what's going to break when I push this policy, when I activate this policy? Tell me what's going to break. Without actually What breaking. intent did I actually change in the network, or what policies yep. did yeah. I potentially break? What compliance you know, am, I, am I violating? And, and now I can do that in advance. I mean, it's, it's amazing stuff. Now that's perfect. We're going to have to go out to the show floor in just a second, mm -hmm. uh, but TJ, you guys have a, have a the demonstration, it's not exactly what you're talking about, but you guys are doing some stuff yes. out on the show floor and you've got a session tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow at 1.15, the PSO DCN 2555, YACI, PSO DCN. half of it is talk, half of it is demonstrations of yeah. how easy ACI actually is, the fully automated yep. policy-driven fabric, and we're including an assurance demo in that as well. That's and I'm perfect. doing a PSO kind of deep dive in this talk track, uh, this afternoon, as a matter of fact. So you're not done, you guys have a lot more work no, in front of you. We're just getting started. But no, you're ready. It's no okay. vacation in Barcelona. Yeah. <laughs> All right, TJ, thank you so much. Danny, thank right, you thank so you, much. Thank you, Guys, we want to check that out on the show floor. I believe we've got a very special interactive something or another going on. Let's check and see what that is. Thank you, Rob. I'm here at the World of Solutions and one of the most exciting demos we've got at World of the Solutions is the Cyber Escape Room. The idea is that participants or attendees of Cisco Live can actually play this game. Uh, they arrive at the, well, a crime scene, right? So someone's actually, uh, a company's been breached and they can help to solve that breach. They can help to, using ACI and intent-based network to understand what was the problem, find a problem, and current in it, and then prevent future breaches. Now, um, they, um, as part of the game, there is a janitor in the room that can then give them hints, right, the, to the attendees. So I've got Sandra here, um, and hi, Sandra. All right. I'll do, all right? Yes, thank you. Thank you for being with us. So Sandra, tell us about the game and what your role is in the game. Um, well, um, it's not really a game, it's very serious because I've just come in, right, because I'm at the end of my shift and that, and I get in the room and it's a right mess because there's been some criminals broke in. So I've called security right away, of course, and they said there's been a major security breach and uh, they've told me you lot are coming down here because you're the experts, right? You're the experts at solving stuff and that. So I'm, I'm waiting for you. Hurry up. We need to get on with this and sort it out so I can go home and go to bed. Thank you, Sandra. So yes, please get over here to World of Solutions to the cyber escape room and help Sandra with this situation. And we're going to come back here tomorrow on Wednesday and we're actually going to interview the attendees that are going in and out, and we just had one of the teams that solved the challenge. They're now taking their you know, social media videos and uh, photos. So do look at our hashtag C-L-E-U-R, and you might even find uh, you know, their pictures. So thank you, and now back to Rob in the studio. Excellent, thank you so much. You're killing me over there. I love that stuff. <laughs> All right guys, thank you so much for that. Uh, joining me right now in studio, we have John Marshall, Thank you. I feel like that's the name of a famous, um, is that a movie? Is there a name? Is there a John uh, Marshall? Yeah, Supreme Court Justice, actually. But oh, that's I'm not related, so. No relation. No, not at all. No relation. Well, I won't ask you to adjudicate on anything you're not comfortable with. <laughs> uh, but you're a Cisco veteran. 
Yes. Uh, you specifically work in our software buying programs. Am I That's using correct. the right? Yes. Okay, so here's what I really want to understand, because I can tell you, I've never, because I don't have to be involved with that much, I'm not on the customer buying side, mm -hmm. but I think I used to be in the field, and I know one of the challenges that we always dealt with, and this was before kind of the evolution of things happening, yeah. is that it wasn't always easy to, boy, you really had to work tightly with your sales rep and your engineer to yep. figure out all the little bits and bobs and stuff and get a skew correct to get what you want. That's and right. then renewals came up and everything was a little bit confusing. It feels like we're really way past that now, but we're still in an evolution. Can you kind of chart how far have we come? What, is, what are we doing now as enterprise assurance, I guess is how we say it? And then, yeah, how, how do we, uh, well, what's important? Well, it's actually not related to the application, but, okay, gotcha. so let me, let me put it this way. So from a software strategy, we focus in three areas. One as we always have, which is delivering high value applications to, and uh, okay. you know, offers to the customer. Second, it's about really how uh, consistent buying programs get presented, and I'll talk a lot about that, I, I think. I want to hear more about that. And then third, of course, we work with our partners to ensure that the customers can extract the maximum value out of that over the life cycle of the software. Those are really the three areas. I think uh, the evolution, because we've been around Cisco a little bit, yeah, yeah. has been mostly in the area of uh, and you've seen it piloted at first with security, which is obviously based on software. I mean, the threat protection and uh, threat defense and things that we deliver to our customers is really on a minute by minute basis. Right. So that all has to get delivered software out to the platforms that are running it and so on. Collaborations made that transition because it came out of a legacy world that was really predominantly premise based, right? right for right. its communication systems okay. and is m marrying that or bridging that, if you will, to cloud-based, which is where all the things such as the Teams and the WebEx are coming out of. So their evolution was to how to figure out how to get that all lined up in a way that customers could get the flexibility to choose okay. where that was deployed, how they wanted to maximize that capability and high value applications. Okay. The, and I'd say, just from an offer level standpoint, that's really what's exciting about what's going on right now within our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So uh, enterprise networking, data center, et cetera. That's all about that same transition, if you think about it. Right. So what's been legacy or traditionally on-premise, which is going to continue, right. and how that gets bridged into uh, flexible um, models that are cloud-based, and so you have, basically, you have a mixed environment, a hybrid environment, if you right. will, in those, right. and so uh, essentially the offers have to align to that, and that's what you see you know, being announced, certainly with Data Center here today. Well, it, it feels like, so there's no longer this notion of I've got to go through pages and pages of potential options and figure out what the right mix or match is. Right. I don't want to say, I don't, bundle sometimes is perceived as a bad word, but and I kind of just mean it in the sense that we've made a lot of things easier where you're not making a trade-off based decision. Yeah. But, but it's about a relationship because we're now we are recommitting to the customer about how much, how yeah. present do we remain. We're not done at the PO yeah. at a date and time, right? Exactly, you're, you're spot on. I know you came from a field experience, so you've, you've seen this with yeah. customers. You know, our growth in Cisco has been exponential, really getting the engine of, you know, the reliability, the, the uh, scale, et cetera, particularly into our, in our enterprise networks and mm -hmm. our data center. What's happening now is that we're trying to simplify that in our relationship, and that's where the, that's where the enterprise okay. agreement, Cisco's enterprise agreement comes in. Launched that in May of 2017, so it's just a little over 18 months in the market. Yeah. Has been hugely successful, literally 100% year over year growth in that for the last two years. And the reason why is because the customers see how that puts this into a simple way to consume, manage, buy, and take, you know, take care of their whole enterprise across that. Okay. So no longer in that piece by piece buying. We've got 15 seconds, I apologize, okay. but yeah. But get it into something that over time we have a consistent price predictability, scalability, and flexibility. Perfect, thank you John. We're going over to Liz and Tony right now for the showcase. Hello everyone and welcome to the Innovation Showcase Theater. My name's Toby and I have the pleasure of being your host today. Now we all know that to thrive in the new world of digital business, companies have to innovate at an unprecedented rate. So we're bringing you 11 sessions here at the Innovation Showcase, where we will share with you the latest solutions, service innovation,